Hey guys, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is David Dorner, and I am the teaching pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it is so good to be with you. Our mission in this world is to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus for a lifetime or if your journey's just begun, we hope that this message will speak powerfully to your heart, that it will reveal something that God desires to cultivate in your life, and that you'll be drawn to the person of Jesus as a result. We hope these next few moments encourage you, challenge you, and inspire you to be who God has created you to be. We hope you enjoy it. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you again. Great to be back with you. It's been a couple weeks since I've been here. If you're joining us online, it's great to have you with us as well. As we uh, have entered, last week we started this series called Summer in the Psalms, and we're just walking through the hope and the promises that we have in the Psalms uh, throughout this summer. And so today, I want to look at Psalm 16. And if you were here at the beginning of the service, uh, you heard Carol Ann um, walk us through that psalm. We read it together. But Psalm 16 is, is an absolutely powerful psalm that includes a promise for us. And so we're going to unpack that today. Uh, I'll introduce it this way. Um, my wife and I have been married for almost 23 years, and she tells me that I am the dramatic one in our marriage. Have you ever noticed this? In, every, in most marriages, I would say this is true. You have like the calm, rational one, and then you've got the one that is the dramatic one. I am the dramatic one in our marriage, uh, apparently. By dramatic, I mean whenever something happens, I tend to freak out and take like the worst possible scenario in my head. Uh, an example of this, all the way back when we were engaged, we were still in college together, It was the year that that we got engaged, and I was walking out of class one day, out of the building that my class was in. I walk out into the parking lot, and I'm looking for my car. And so I circle around the parking lot once. I, I circle around the parking lot a second time. I can't find my car. And so in that moment, I came to what I thought was the inevitable, obvious conclusion that someone had stolen my 1987 Cutlass Cruiser station wagon. Carrie was suspicious. I called her up. I'm like, somebody stole my car. And she was like, your car? Really? Are you sure? Here's, here's what she said. I literally remember her saying this. Uh, she said, are you sure you didn't just forget that you walked to class this morning and your car is actually just parked somewhere else on campus in some other parking lot somewhere? Yeah, I mean, it was like insulting. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? No, I didn't forget that I walked to class this morning. And so what I did instead is I marched straight up to the campus security office, which was in the upstairs of the student admin building at Indiana Westland. And I went through the process to fill out the paperwork to report my car stolen. And literally, this took a while. It was like quite a process. So I fill out all the paperwork. I report my car stolen. I walk from the student admin building back to my dorm As I'm walking through the parking lot of my dorm, there in a parking space, I see that the thief who stole my car had parked it back in my dorm parking lot. (laughs) Or at least that's the story I told and I'm still telling it all these years later. That's the story I'm sticking to. (laughs) Have have you ever done that? Have Have you ever freaked out? Have you have you ever had some event, some moment happened in your life and immediately your thoughts, your mind just kind of conceived the worst possible scenario and then you went down that path. Uh, Viktor Frankl, one of my favorite authors, he, he was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, he made this statement. He said, between stimulus and response lies a space. In that space lie our freedom and power to choose a response. In our response lies our growth and our happiness. What Viktor Frankl is saying is that if something has happened in your life, like, I don't know, a global pandemic, (laughs) if something has taken place, you are in a space. You're, You're in this space right now between stimulus and response. And how you respond really does matter. And so where your mind goes, where your thoughts go, tends to be where the rest of you travels. So so the question is, are we growing through our experiences or are we just going through our experiences? Psalm 16 begs us to ask this question. 
Where do you go? Where do you go in tough times? Where do you go when everything has uh, fallen apart? Where, where do you go when you find yourself in that space between stimulus and response? Psalm 16, uh, in your Bible, it probably says under the heading, it says uh, a miktam of David. Psalm 16 is called a miktam. Now, we don't actually know what the word miktam means. There, there's, there's just kind of guesses as to what the Hebrew word miktam must mean. But if you look at all the other miktams of David in the Psalms, and you look at other miktams that were written by other psalm writers in the book of Psalms, what you begin to notice is that what they have in common is they were all written in the midst of a crisis. They seem to all be written right in the midst of a tough time. So they're not really a lament, like grieving what's already happened, and they're not really a psalm of praise. They're kind of psalms that, right in the midst of everything blowing up, where you're kind of going, I, what do I do with this? <laughs> where do I go? What, what am I supposed to do? How do I respond? When the pressure comes up, when you feel overwhelmed, and you know you've got to say something, you've got to do something, where do you go? Where do you go? What this psalm gives us is this path, really. And what I'm hoping is that for some of you today, if you're in the midst of something, uh, if you're going through something, if, if the news has just hit, or if you're trying to figure out how to respond to the pressure that you're feeling, I'm hoping that today this psalm is going to provide you what has provided me so many times is, is a path. How do you engage God? Where do you go? Because where you go with your brain, where you go with your thoughts and your mind, tends to be where the rest of your life will travel. Where do you go? And so I know we've prayed a lot this morning. I just, I feel led to just say a quick prayer uh, before, and then what I want to do is I just want to allow this, map, this psalm to be like a road map for us. We're just going to walk through it together because it gives us such a beautiful road map of how to engage God in a tough time. So you pray with me. Lord, we just come to you right now. Uh, God, I just pray for my brothers and sisters, whether they're watching online or here in this room, that are in the midst of something. And they're trying to figure out, what do I do with this? Maybe they even came to church this morning or turned on church this morning thinking, uh, maybe I'll find an answer. M maybe there will be something that's said that will give me some sort of guidance. I pray that you would meet us in this psalm, Jesus. I pray that you would speak your words to us, that each one of us would hear what we need to hear from you. We ask this in your name. Amen. You ready? All right, so here we go, Psalm 16. This is how David begins the psalm. In that very first opening verse, what he says is he makes a statement, apart from you, I have no good thing. Apart from you, David says, I have no good thing. That's how he starts his engagement with God. Uh, there are some translations that, that actually say, my goodness is nothing apart from you. So, so what David is acknowledging is he's saying, look, I can't fix what's broken here. I have nothing apart from you. Apart from you, my goodness is nothing. Now, I want you to realize this is the complete opposite of what our culture teaches us. The message of every pop psychologist out there, the message of every self-help guru is actually the opposite of this. What our culture will tell us over and over again is that the biggest problems that you or I ever will face are external to us. They're outside of us. They're out there. But don't worry because you have what it takes on the inside to overcome. That's the message our culture will give us. So just live your true self. Be your authentic true self. Because every, every problem you face is actually out there. It's external. But you, on the inside, have what it takes to overcome. And so the message we hear is, so live your truth. Right? Right? Just embrace whatever identity is most you, whether it be a sexual identity, whether it be some other kind of identity, and just live out of that identity, and that will solve all your problems. That's the secular picture of salvation or of true living. I was talking with um, a psychologist. She's been a Christian counselor for years and years and years, and she was telling me there is such a difference today for what people come and ask for counseling for uh, compared to what they used to several years ago. She said it used to be several years ago, people would come to a Christian counselor and what they would be asking for is, hey, can you help me fix this problem in, in my life? Can you help me work on me? So in other words, can you help me be a better father? 
I've got some problems there. Can you help me be a better husband? Can you help me be a better wife? Uh, can you help me be a better leader, you know, in my, in my work or whatever? Can you help me work on me? And she said, uh, recently, in, in recent years, what it's become more is people don't come to counseling for that. Now, when people come to counseling, what they ask help for is, hey, can you help me work on that person over there? Can you help me figure out how to deal with my spouse? Because they won't change. No matter what, I keep waiting and they won't change. So can you help me, counsel me with how to deal with them? Can you, there are these toxic people at work over here. I need some counseling. I need some help to help me figure out how to work on them. That's what people say now. The biggest problems you face are out there, external to you, but inside, you have what it takes. That's the opposite of the biblical message. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible actually says the opposite. What the Bible actually teaches all the way through is that the biggest problems you will ever face in your life are internal. They're inside of you. The Bible says you were born with a sin nature. From, from the womb, one of the other psalmists says, I was, I was broken from, from the womb. Uh, from the time we were very little, we, we have this proclivity to go our own direction. Have you ever noticed this? If you're parents, this is why you never had to teach your two-year-old how to lie. You notice that? All of a sudden, one day, they just started lying. You're like, what? how did you figure that out? I didn't teach you that. It's because we just figure that stuff out. It's because we are broken. We, we're fallen. We have a sin nature inside of all of us. And so the biggest problems we face are actually on the inside of us. And so we need help from the outside. We need God to help us from the outside. That's the message of the scriptures. That's what David's saying in this passage. He begins, apart from you, I have no good thing. My goodness is nothing apart from you. What David is saying is, I don't have what it takes on the inside to fix this problem. It's too big for me. I need help from the outside. But my friends, listen to me very, very closely. All healing in your life, all spiritual growth in your life begins with that confession. All, any sort of true healing or any sort of true spiritual growth begins with that realization, with that acknowledgement, with that, with that confession. God, I can't fix this mess. I don't have what it takes, and I need help from the outside. I need you to be my source, God. I need you to be the help from the outside. That's where David begins. I would tell you that's where all of us need to begin. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're in the midst of, that's where you start. From there, he moves on. He makes this statement, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take their names on my lips. Now, we read that and we're like, what is he, libations of blood? Like, what is he talking about? What David's referencing there is the idolatry of his day. He's referencing the way that people would worship and would indulge themselves in the cult practices of the other gods of his day. So essentially what he's acknowledging, he's saying, look, I don't have what it takes on the inside. I need help from the outside. But man, the idols that other people run to in our culture and our world, that's not the kind of help from the outside I need. That's not healthy. People who do that just suffer more and more. People who embrace idolatry, people who embrace, uh, the, you know, the gods of this world to indulge themselves in, they just end up suffering. They just end up addicts, to be honest. I mean, think about what, where do you run to in order to cope? When the pressure builds, when you find yourself in that space between stimulus and response, uh, where do you run outside of yourself to cope? Is, is it alcohol? Uh, is it pornography? Is it food? Um, is it, maybe it's achievements at work. Maybe it's our kids. Sometimes I think we can, we can even make our kids an idol that we run to to try to cope. But, but these make up the addictions of our world. You think about our culture, our, our culture actually teaches us to celebrate. We, from the time we're very little, we learn to celebrate people with addictions. We have so normalized addictions in our world and our culture that we hardly even notice it, that we hardly even see it. I mean, this was one of my childhood heroes right here. 
clearly an addict, if ever there was one. (laughs) The message of our culture from the time we're very young is, if you're in a tough spot, if you're really wrestling and trying to figure out where to go, indulge. Just, Just get help from over here. And what David is saying is he's saying, look, I don't have what it takes within myself. I, I, he, he goes, I need help from the outside, but I'm not going to go indulge over here. That's not the kind of help from the outside I need. And he acknowledges that. And so finally, he comes to really what is the turning point of the passage. It, it's, the, it's the moment where everything shifts in the whole psalm. And he says this, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. So he says, the Lord, it, it's you. I can't go to anywhere else to get what I need but you. That's what he says. Now, whenever a biblical writer talks about their portion, uh, whenever you see that in the scriptures, what the biblical writer is talking about there in ancient Israel, they're talking about their inheritance. In fact, some translations of this say, you make my inheritance secure. Now, think about this. Uh, David, King David is the one who wrote this psalm. King David was the youngest of several sons. Did David have an inheritance? No, he did not. If you understood the way it worked in ancient Israel, the the oldest son would get the lion's share of the inheritance, and then it would kind of trickle down from there. David is the youngest of several sons. He's getting nothing. He has no inheritance. So this is really a beautiful statement. Uh, What he's saying right here, he's saying, Lord, you are my inheritance. You are my portion. You are my cup. In other words, you are the one who's going to take care of me no matter what happens. You're the one I can count on being there. It's you, Lord. You're the one who's going to sustain me through this time. That's what he's saying. But what's so amazing is about it, he doesn't stop there with just that statement. Look at what he said next. This is so key to understanding what he's saying. He says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So it's not just like a one-time thing. Like, hey, when I was 12 years old, I turned to the Lord and I, I just, I made him my portion and my cup. There was this one time when I was in a tough spot, I came to God. No, it's, he says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Through COVID, I don't back off. Through difficult things that happen in my life, I don't back off. I don't uh, fade away. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He's saying, I, I fix my eyes on him. See, David understood something. He understood that darkness doesn't actually have to destroy you. It just has to distract you. And if, and if it can do that, you'll go right back. You'll do it yourself. You'll destroy yourself. Watchman Nee, a great spiritual writer, uh, he said, Satan's main goal is to get us to act unaided by God. See, see, we don't think that, do we? We think Satan's main goal is to like try to attack us in some major dramatic way or try to put some giant temptation in front of us that's going to blow up our whole life. That's not what he does. Satan's main goal is just to distract you, to get you to act unaided, to, to get your eyes off Jesus. Because he knows if he can do that, you're done. You're going to go right back to just carrying the burden yourself, looking within yourself, trying to figure out the answer. You're going to start looking to those other gods, those other ways that you indulge and try to cope. You'll destroy yourself. All he has to do is distract you. We think about the relationship that Jesus told us to have with him. John 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kind of relationship they're supposed to have with him. And what he says is, I'm the vine. You remember this? Some some of you remember this? I'm the vine. You're the branches. And Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You need help from the outside. Apart from me, you have no hope. But But if you remain in me, he says, I'll do the work. When you you rest in me, when you keep your eyes fixed on me, it's meant to be this daily rhythm where we stay in connection with with Jesus, where we just bring him whatever's heavy in our lives, we bring him what's what's going on inside of us. When our thoughts are, are freaking out, when we're in that space between stimulus and response, we go to him and we just rest in him, we remain in him. And and what he promises, he says, I'll do the work. I'll produce the fruit. I'll be the one that does it. Your job is not to fix it. Your job is to remain in me. Your your job is to keep your eyes fixed on me. 
And what he says is, I'm the one who will take care of it. It's this beautiful roadmap, this beautiful pathway of how we can engage God in the midst of a tough time. But my favorite part of this psalm is actually what comes next. Because this psalm is, is way more than just a, a roadmap of where to go when we're in a tough time. It's way more than just some good advice about how to handle yourself when you're in a tough time. This psalm actually concludes with a promise that all our tough times will eventually be reconciled in the person of Jesus. This is so powerful. Take a look at this. This is, this is how David ends this psalm. He says, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Now, uh, when you read that, this is David who wrote this. It's in the Old Testament. If you only read this in the Old Testament, you don't even understand the fullness of what is being talked about here. In order to actually understand this psalm and understand the promise that is within it, you actually have to go to the New Testament of the Bible. You have to go to Acts chapter 2, to the day of Pentecost. Peter is in the temple. He's preaching. The Holy Spirit has arrived on the scene. Peter is preaching to this crowd of people. And what Peter does is he quotes these verses right here from Psalm 16. And what Peter actually says in Acts 2, starting in verse 25 and going on, is he says, David, in this moment, King David was speaking prophetically about somebody other than himself. And, and here's Peter's logic. Here's his reason. And he says, David makes these statements because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your faithful ones see decay. And Peter's logic is, isn't David dead? Isn't that the way you understand? Didn't he die generations ago? Isn't he in the grave? So apparently David was talking about another one, one that would come from the fruit of his body, from, from his line. And in this moment, what, what King David was prophetically speaking about was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the one who went to the cross. He was the one who was not abandoned to the realm of the dead. He was the faithful one when we were not faithful who didn't see decay. And in Jesus, when he rose from the grave, when we put our faith and we put our trust in the person of Jesus, we get the life that he deserved. He died the death that we deserved so we could get the life that only he deserved. And so the greatest enemy that any of us will ever face, the only thing that we really have left to be afraid of as human beings, death, has been completely overcome. This psalm is not just about protection in a tough time. It's about resurrection. It's about how God will redeem and reconcile even the worst stuff that's happened in your life. I love what George Herbert said. He said, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. In other words, all, he, all death can do is plant you. Just like you plant a bulb, and about this time of year, something more beautiful grows up out of the ground. Hopefully, something more beautiful grows out of the ground. In the same way, that's all death has the power to do anymore, is, is just plant us and prepare for the greater thing, the resurrection of our lives and our bodies for all of eternity, that Jesus won for us by his resurrection. Um, there's a reason that I chose this psalm as the first psalm I wanted to preach on in this series, Psalm 16. And the reason is because in January, I was given the news, and many, most of you know this, um, that the cancer had progressed and that I, it was time for me to go through chemotherapy. And so in January, when I got that news that I was going to have to go through chemo, I was not going to Psalm 16. I was going to Google. That's where I was going. In that space between stimulus and response, trying to figure out how do I deal with this, what do I do, I was going to my phone, I was going to Google, and I was Googling stuff like, you know, what's, uh, you know what are the side effects of this particular chemotherapy drug, uh, what are the long-term effects, how does it affect you long-term, what's, what's the prognosis, uh, the, the long survival rates of people who have my disease when it progresses, and so I would just, and I, seriously, no joke at all, I would lose like an hour. It was crazy. I'd just go to Google one thing and I'd look up and it'd be like an hour had passed. 
And don't get me wrong, like there's nothing wrong with educating yourself and understanding more, you know, about your, your illness or whatever, but this was like obsession. I was losing chunks of my day and I didn't even know where it went. I was just, and because here's, here's the lie. The lie you believe is that if I just understand this better, then somehow I'll be able to control it and that'll make me feel better. But that's not actually what happens. The more you Google, the more you go on WebMD, the more you do that stuff, the more it leads to anxiety and worry and fear. That's all it was producing. That's the only fruit it was producing in my life. And so I would go to Carrie, my wife, who, who is a nurse, and I would say, look at this. Look at what I just Googled. Look at what it says. It could happen. And uh, here, no joke at all, this is what my wife said to me. She said, uh, listen, it is not my job to talk you off the ledge when you've been Googling for an hour. I told you she's the calm, rational one in our marriage, right? That was my wife, my nurse wife's compassionate response to me. It is not my job when, you, when you've gone there to somehow talk you off the ledge. And so I want you to hear like going down this path of Psalm 16 is something I've had to learn to train my mind to do. That's, that's what you have to do. Wherever your thoughts are right now, you have to train them to go down a different path. David said, this, he says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. This is intention. That's what it's speaking to. It's an act of the will. I, I'm focused here. And so what I've found is when I'm starting to freak out, uh, when I find myself wanting to pick up the phone and Google something, when something occurs to me, if I can just train my mind, no, I'm not going to go down that path. If I can train my mind to go down this different path, God, this is too big for me. I can't fix it. I don't have within myself the ability to control this or fix it. I need help from the outside. Would you be my help right now? I'm not going to turn to this. I'm not going to turn to these other ways of coping. I'm not going to turn to Google. I'm not going to turn to these other things. You alone are my portion and my cup, you are, you are my only good thing. I keep my eyes focused on you. And I'm telling you, if you will do that, if you will start to train your mind to go there instead of the other places we all tend to go, anxiety, worry, fear, those things begin to just lose their grip. To the point where I can honestly say to you that while I don't know, I mean, cancer may define the way that I die someday. It might. Cancer may define the way that you die someday. But cancer has no power to define the way that you live now or for all of eternity. It doesn't have that power. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, because of the hope that we have in Him. And so here's my challenge to you as we close today. It's summertime. We're all kind of rebounding from the last year, the last, I don't know, whatever, it's a year and a half, 16 months, whatever it's been. You're in a space right now between stimulus and response. Uh, if you're tired, if you're lonely, if you're frustrated, where are you going? Where are you running to? What are you allowing to be your portion and your source? What are you keeping your eyes fixed on? I'm telling you where your thoughts go, where your mind goes, that's where the rest of you is going to go. And God has provided us everything we need in the person of Jesus to sustain us and walk us through the times that we're in right now and all the times that we're ever going to face for the future. Would you pray with me? So, Lord Jesus, as we respond this morning, um, God, this morning we just want to offer you our minds. Uh, where there is a tendency, God, to freak out, uh, where there's a tendency to think, I've got to somehow fix this or get control of it, would you help us to just begin with that confession, Lord, we need help from the outside. We don't have what it takes on the inside to fix uh, what we face. And God, would that confession just be the beginning of healing? Would that confession just be the beginning of your, the work of your Holy Spirit moving and working in our lives? God, uh, there's places where maybe we've taken our eyes off of you 
we've allowed ourselves to look for other ways to cope, we turn to you. (laughs) You are our only good thing. You are uh, the one who can sustain us. And so, Jesus, would you move, would you speak uh, where each of us live, where each of us are? Thank you for this hope that we have. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you died the death we deserve so that we can live the life that only you earned. Would you help us to lean into that life? Would you help us to actually embrace that life? Uh, To not just sort of think that it's for someone else, but that that peace and that trust and that hope that we can have, I pray that that would be each one of ours because we know you, Jesus. We ask this in the risen and resurrected and powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.